In the statistics from NBD BookScan, I will caution you again that BookScan only covers print sales, so all those ebooks that are surging aren't included. Plus, it does include Amazon's sales figures, and Amazon sells more than 50% of all books sold in the United States. So take this with a grain of salt. But BookScan says that print sales went up about 10% over the last week. Well, to put that in perspective, remember that those sales plummeted much like the stock market when this all began. So saying that it's up 10% is possibly not saying that much, but it's better than seeing them go down more. Here's a new something, a flash that I didn't expect. Print on demand during this crisis is being used more by major publishers, by big five publishers. If you want to know more about this, read Mike Shetskin's latest column, but you know, breaking it down in summary, he's actually talked to people, talked to people at Ingram and found that traditional publishers are moving quite quickly, in fact, to on-demand printing to help them out during this troubled time when they're not really sure how many to print and they don't really have a lot of book stores to ship books to. According to Shatskin, a guy at Ingram showed him a graph of their print-on-demand business, which is called Lightning Source, and it was shooting up. Just to be clear, this print-on-demand service is open, is available to any publisher, small or large. If you're looking to set up a hardcover, for instance, in print-on-demand, that's about the only place I know to, know of where you can go, but they do other books as well. I mean, print, trade paperback, and whatnot. And even the big five are turning to it in troubled times. Bookstores are starting to reopen cautiously and safely. I know here in Oklahoma, where I live, half price books open today, the day that I'm recording it. You know, they're limiting the number of customers in the stores, which probably isn't a big problem, and people are wearing masks and staying safe, but bookstores are starting to open. Here's a little bit from the flip side, talking about major publishers. There have been rumors that they're delaying payments to authors, and Penguin Random House has now confirmed that they are, in fact, delaying advances to authors. Now, on the positive side, they are still buying books and executing contracts. They're just delaying when they make the first advance payment. Advances are the exception, not the rule these days, so maybe we shouldn't complain too much. But for extremely large six-digit advances, they are delaying payments. They're not the only ones. I talked last time about how Barnes & Noble was delaying paying royalties. This continues to be true. Smashwords reports that they reached some kind of accommodation, which allowed them to get all the royalties owed. Draft to Digital reports that they received one-third of the royalties due and are still waiting for the rest, which, you know, there's no guarantee they'll ever get it. Nonetheless, Draft to Digital said they had a commitment to their authors, and so they decided to make the authors whole and to pay the full royalty amount out of their own pocket. You've heard me talk about this company before, and now perhaps you understand why I think they are such terrific stand-up guys. That's the kind of partner you want. Just to summarize, if I may, I think it's, I mean, you see this everywhere, people talking about this. They're speculating that this is going to seriously hurt traditional publishing, this lockdown and sales slump. Self-published authors may be the ones who come out best. And again, I'm not telling you what to do or advocating one path over another. But independent authors are, of course, less dependent upon print sales. They offer generally lower ebook prices. And they can put their titles in ebook subscription services, Scribed or KU or whatever, and those have become more popular and probably will continue to be more popular. We're seeing more people reading ebooks. 
and I doubt that's going to change. And, of course, independently published authors and self-published authors don't have to worry about publisher cash flow or bookstore cash flow or somebody taking bankruptcy and they never getting their money. I suspect this is a major turning point, much like 2009 was when the first viable e-readers came out and e-books started to become significant and the whole publishing industry was turned upside down. I think we may be seeing the same thing happening now. So stay tuned. This is a time when writers need to be aware of what's going on out there. I got the idea for the writing tips section from a study recently published. It was conducted by researchers at Durham University. They teamed up with The Guardian, the newspaper I mentioned earlier, and the Edinburgh International Book Festival. They surveyed 181 authors who came to the festival, and here's the big takeaway, widely reported in the media, 63% of those authors said they heard their characters speak while writing. 61% reported that their characters were capable of acting independently. Quote, I hear them in my mind. They have distinct voice patterns and tones, and I can make them carry on conversations with each other in which I can always tell who is talking. End quote. I read this and I thought, really? That's a news story? You had to do a study? I could have told them that. I've been doing it for a long... I've been having conversations with fictional characters for more than 30 years from now. There's no shame here. There's nothing unusual about it. It just means that you are a working writer. I, You know, most of those conversations are subvocalized in my head, not aloud. But actually, sometimes I do have these conversations out loud, particularly when I'm trying to hear the dialogue and make sure it's just right for that character, or I've chosen the right word, if it's something that's supposed to be funny, you know, does this work better, or does this word work better? And you say it aloud, and you hear it, and uh, frankly, at my house, they're used to it. It's just that dad's doing it again. or (laughs) It's no big deal. I do it sometimes, honestly, in the afternoons. I go on a walk around the neighborhood, and that's probably more likely to cause gossip. But Here's my tip there. Get a pair of ear earbuds or AirPods or whatever you got and put them in your ears. Even if you're not actually listening to anything, your neighbors will assume that you're having a phone conversation. They'll still think you're weird because you're a writer, but that may mitigate it a little bit. At any rate, and here's the tip. Feel no shame. There is nothing wrong with it. It doesn't mean you're weird or insane. It is perfectly normal. It's part of the creative process. And frankly, I think it's a good thing. I think it's a positive thing because that tells me two things. One, if you can have a conversation with your fictional characters, then you've probably created a character that is round, that is fleshed out, three-dimensional in your head. You understand them well enough that you can talk to them. And two, that tells me that your subconscious is at work in this book. You've heard me say before, or you've read it in the Red Sneaker books, that I recommend that you write every day when you're working on a book, among other reasons, like trying to get it done in a reasonable period of time. That keeps it in your head. And what you find is your subconscious will be thinking about the book even when you're not. So you'll be more ready to roll when you actually sit down to write. That's why the ideas or the conversations come when I'm walking in the afternoon. I don't go out consciously thinking I got to work out chapter 47, at least not most of the time, but my subconscious knows I'm going to be working the next day. So it starts thinking about the book and planning ahead, which may indeed involve having a conversation with a fictional character. Nothing wrong with it. Own it. We're writers. We can do weird stuff. So my interview guest for this podcast is Laura Bernhardt. 
as I think I mentioned, she's got a new book coming out. At, well, it came out on Tuesday called Ghosts of Guthrie. That's a city in Oklahoma. And it's the third book in her series of supernatural adventures called The Wantland Files. But what you may not know is that she's also the editor-in-chief of Balkan Press, which publishes many wonder, wonderful books and also puts out the Conclave Literary Magazine. She's been doing both writing and publishing for a while, and so I asked her, what's the top ten list? What have you learned? What advice can you give our listeners? Here's what she came up with. Laura, thanks for being on the podcast. Thank you for having me. It's all my pleasure. So, congratulations on Ghosts of Guthrie. Thank you. Fourth published novel, right? Yes, that's right. Third Third. in the series, fourth book. And you're also about to bring out the next issue of Conclave. How many Conclaves have there been so far? Oof. I didn't know there would be a quiz. (laughs) Several. Five? And they're all available at Amazon, (laughs) right? Yes. Uh, Literary magazine. The theme this time is... Outliers. Right. So... Tell me, what have you learned? Give me your top five list. Top five. Okay. Number one, I would say uh, learn to listen. Working with your editor and your publisher means you're trusting someone else to help you with your work. And they also have a stake in your book. They want only the best for it. So much like when you send out that manuscript, your baby, if you will, to your beta readers for the first time. It's not exactly fun to have someone find errors or flimsy chapters. Uh, Worst of all, to come back and say they were a little bit confused by something. Maybe it didn't flow well or make sense to them. But you really need to listen to that feedback and consider it. We don't always have to change every little thing that someone mentions during the editing process, especially if it's just simply a matter of taste. Maybe I like this word better. Now, if you're misusing a word, if you've chosen the wrong word and it doesn't make sense, sure. But you can be the ultimate decision maker on what sounds best and and what you like best. But what if your editor or publisher tells you something that's just, you're like, Ah, that's a horrible idea. I can't do that. I think that the author should always have the final say when possible. Sometimes there are going to be house rules that must be followed by the editor. Sometimes they don't really have a choice. I'll be honest. I always wind up liking my revised work better. (laughs) I really do. After I get over it and think about it. And I may not use their suggestions specifically, but I'll go back and look at what they're talking about and I'll... Find a better way. Yeah, I agree with that part. Anything that makes you think twice about, or probably 10 or 12 times, or whatever, (laughs) and think again about something is probably good. I think I've told this before about my first book, Primary Justice. They made changes throughout good. I was a baby. I, I had a lot to learn, but they changed the ending like the last sentence, and that just hurt my soul. That was when I was being brilliant. Oh, (laughs) <laughs> and 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 being you know hammering people over the head with a the theme, and it broke my heart. Except now I read it and think, wow, that's better. Thank goodness. Right, exactly. And that's my, kind of my final point here. Uh, you need to trust the editor and the publisher because again, they have a huge stake in your book and your success. Uh, if you don't trust them, can't work with them, or simply won't make any changes to your work, it's It's probably time to move on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Number two. Be gracious and respectful above all else. Responding defensively, making unintended assumptions, or implying that your editor had no right to question (laughs) anything at all about your work. Just it won't get you anywhere. Just like anything else in life, being rude won't end well. It will only burn bridges for you. That's a good point. I think a lot, a lot of people, you know, in school, they hear the stories about what a pain in the neck Thomas Wolfe was to work with and about Maxwell Perkins humor or whatever. And they think that's what 
writers are supposed to be. They're all mm. supposed to be, you know, irascible Oof. and and problematic, but that's not really the ticket to success, is it? No, I I don't think so. I don't think anyone wants to work like that. I know I don't. I, which which is not to say you yeah. need to be a doormat either. Well, but sure. you can disagree with someone without. 